All right, so we're finally at the stage we're going to look at ethnicity, right? Uh, previously, if you remember, um, we started at the very beginning of the book of Genesis. At the beginning of the Bible, we looked at stuff like mankind, image, being made in God's image, being made in God's likeness. We looked at different categories of what it meant to be made in God's image and in his likeness from Genesis 1 to 3. Um, we looked at how human beings were created, uh, how all the other animals and vegetables and stuff was made according to their kinds, whereas human beings were made in the image of God. Uh, we saw that humans were made so that they would rule and they were supposed to rule together rather than like ruling over one another. And um, we also looked at the so-called curse of Ham and saw how that wasn't in any way saying that black people were supposed to be slaves. Um, and we then looked at British history to see how did Britain respond to the doctrine of the image of God, right? Um, and we went through all that stuff and then came up with a tentative conclusion and strategy for how the church in Britain can deal with racism and classism, right? And now we're moving on to Genesis chapter 10, which is what a lot of people call the table of nations, but I've called it the spread of people or the spread of the people. Okay. Um, so the reason why this is going to be helpful is because I think in Genesis 10, we start to get a bit of an understanding of what people today would call ethnicity, right? So historically, we saw that in Britain, race replaced the image of God in terms of how British people thought about Africans and themselves, right? And we've seen how race was based on pseudoscience. Uh, it wasn't really scientific. And that has been rejected by most scientists and anthropologists today. And the term that people generally prefer to use today is ethnicity. But some different people have slightly different definitions of ethnicity. So just to have some kind of definition, um, uh, I'll share with you how the Encyclopedia Britannica views ethnicity. If I paraphrase their definition, it's the identification of a group that is culturally distinct to others. OK, so there's a group of people who are culturally distinct to other groups of people. And what they mean by culturally distinct is they're talking about their language, their music, their values, their art, their styles, their literature, their family life, their religion, their rituals, their food, their naming and their public life and their material culture. OK, so th those things are all listed in the encyclopedia. Material culture is the stuff that you end up having like tools, you know, um, and material bits of your culture that you can actually touch. So it's not biological. It's not distinctives that are biological. It's not based on physical characteristics, which was how race was viewed. OK, so it's different to race. And so Irish is an ethnic group, whereas white is a racial group. OK, so that is Encyclopedia Britannica's understanding of ethnicity. And different people have similar stuff with slight, slight differences and different nuances and stuff. We're going to go to Genesis 10 to gain a biblical perspective on defining and thinking about people and ethnicity. OK, so Genesis 10 verse 1 says, This is the account of Shem, Ham and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. So after the flood, all of humanity comes from these three men and their wives. OK, and what you notice here in Genesis 10 and even in that first verse there is this word son. OK, or in Hebrew, the word Ben. And you find this word is repeated 12 times throughout Genesis 10. I've given you the verses there. In some of those verses, the, the word is repeated twice. And so what we see right here is that when Moses gives us an account, when God gives us an account of where we come from, 
as humanity, one of the things that is emphasized is about being a son. Okay, which means ethnicity here is in part to do with who your father is. Okay. Now, how does this point to Christ? Well, Jesus was the son of Adam and Jesus was the son of God, right? Um, God's son redeemed us to be adopted as God's other sons. And if we're sons of God, then we're brothers and sisters of each other, you know, Romans 8, 29. So we have a new added kinship. Okay, so, so what this means is that it's significant to know your human ancestry. Okay, it's, it's significant. Um, if, if someone tells you, oh, you're a Christian, so, you know, you're a child of God, so you don't have to think about your, your human ancestry. Don't think about your ethnicity or anything like that. That's irrelevant. Well, that's not really true because right at the beginning, we see the Bible actually teaching us what our ancestry is. It's significant who you are the son of. So that's significant. And it's even more significant to be adopted by God and to know and experience God's sonship and kinship with fellow believers, which means that our adoption from God and our Christian brotherhood should be more ultimate in our lives than our ancestral kinship, right? But, but it doesn't mean that we should ignore our ancestral kinship. Okay, so a biblical view of ethnicity could include ancestry, fatherhood, and points to having God as your father. Okay, now that's, that's the first thing we get about ethnicity from Genesis 10. And at this stage, having just given you a little example, you might be able to work out where we're going with this. We're kind of taking a, a common grace definition of ethnicity. We, you know, we start with the Britannica Encyclopedia. And then we're kind of saying, okay, let's see how that matches up with what the Bible says. And does the Bible give us anything extra about that? You know, because we need help because we've had hundreds of years of racism and classism that as we learn through the historical survey that every century built off the previous century. So none of us approach life with a, a blank slate where we understand ethnicity or race from uh, uh, from ground zero. We're all going by what our parents taught us, what our teachers taught us, and that was influenced by what they were taught in the decades before and in the centuries before. And so we need renewing of the mind. So even though there might be some very good definitions of ethnicity out there, we also want to be saying, but does the Bible actually give us more stuff to help us renew our minds even more so that we're not we're not just saying, OK, we, we don't use the term race anymore. Now we use the term ethnicity, but we actually go even deeper to be like in our hearts and minds. Is there still more renewing that needs to be done even even when we use terms like ethnicity? OK, I hope you're ready to go deep now because we're going to go deep now. Right. We're going to Genesis 10 verse 5 right and it says from these and it's talking about the sons of Japheth right in verse 4 it says the maritime people spread out into their territories by their clans within their nations each with its own language okay and if you've already read through Genesis chapter 10 you can see that you've got a group of these descriptions of how these people spread out and what we're going to do is we're going to focus particularly on verse five to get an understanding of what these words mean when it says peoples when it says spread out when it says clans and nations and language what do these words mean and do they then get used again later in the bible particularly in the new testament and how would that help us think better about ethnicity so start off with, it says the maritime people. So it's describing some people who are like on the coastland, you know, um, or on islands. Um, but we're not going to worry about the word maritime. We're just going to focus on the word peoples. It's the Hebrew word goy. Okay. And in halot, which is like the sort of go-to dictionary, the go-to lexicon for people studying the Old Testament in Hebrew, um, it means the peoples or the nations. But there's a problem with saying nations because today 
uh, what nations means is different to what nations used to mean. Today, we have something, things that are called nation states, which have governments and clearly defined borders. In the ancient world, that w when people said nation, that wasn't what they meant. So I actually think saying peoples is more helpful than nations because it stops you thinking of a modern nation state. Now, another lexicon I like to use is the, the Theological Workbook of the Old Testament, yeah, abbreviated as TWOT. And it's, it, they have, for this word goy here, they've said, it is difficult to ascertain the exact definition of the term. However, if one takes the various usages into consideration, as well as some seemingly related terms, and then it gives these terms um, for the back part of the body, and then a term for the Aramaic for midst, and then another term for living body or corpse, one must conclude, and this is the main bit to get, the basic idea is that of a defined body or group of people or some specific large segment of a given body. The context will generally indicate the specific quality or characteristic which is to be understood. Okay, I must say when I this this has been quite revolutionary to my thinking about these things here. The the, the idea that goy refers to some specific large segment of a given body is the context that will let you know that. And what is the context? The context is you've got all of humanity coming from Adam and then because of the flood coming from Noah and then being spread out into all these different peoples the context is that there's a large body of humanity and then it is splitting off into these different large segments these different so for me here in the context goy refers to a body of people or even a large segment of the body of humanity Okay, and that's really significant for reasons that will become a bit clearer as we go on. So in Genesis 10, there are multiple bodies of people branching out from Japheth into separate bodies of people, which means a biblical view of ethnicity recognizes we are all part of the same one body. You can say I'm part of this ethnic group. But you, what you are really saying is you are part of a large segment of the bigger body of humanity. Okay. So another way of saying that is to say we're all cousins. Whatever, whoever you look at around the world, whatever ethnicity they're from, we are all cousins. So what I'm trying to encourage us to think about here is when we think about different bodies of people, maybe you're used to saying people groups, different peoples, you know, or different ethnicities. When we're thinking about these things, we shouldn't just think about separateness. We should think about oneness, that we are all coming from the same body. A bit like if you, if you were butchering a cow, you know, you've got the ribs, you've got the rump, you've got the leg, you know, all these things, they're all parts of the same one body and, so, and and when you go to eat you you don't just say we're having ribs you say what kind of ribs you're having you know and so we need this same understanding with ethnicity we don't just think of the separate parts but we think of the wholeness about how all that different ethnicities are part of one body called humanity or called image bearers Okay, now you might be thinking, well, why do you keep saying the word ethnicity for the Hebrew word goy? Well, the reason why is because in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, they use the Greek word ethnos for the Hebrew word goy. And ethnos sounds like ethnicity. Now, you can't, you can't just say because it sounds like ethnicity, it's the same thing. But we can say that the, our word ethnicity that we use today comes from the original Greek word ethnos. But that still doesn't mean it, it means the same thing. OK, that, that would be a, a fallacy to say that. But 
as we go through this, we will actually see that where they, how, what the word ethnos means and how it's used in this context does actually fit what we mean by ethnicity today. So um, LSJ, that's Little Scott Lexicon, which is like a go-to lexicon for ancient Greek um, and for Septuagint Greek as well. It says that ethnos is a number of people accustomed to live together, a company or body of men. Notice this word body again, body of men, body of people. Um, now, after Homer, it then took on the meaning of a nation or, or people. Okay. Um, and then in the New Testament, it, in the plural, when it's ta ethne, it means the nations or Gentiles. Okay. Now, in BDAG, which is the Greek dictionary, standard go-to Greek dictionary for New Testament um, studies, uh, they've defined ethnos as a body of persons united by kinship, culture, and common traditions, or nation, or people. Now, that's very similar to our Encyclopedia Britannica definition, right? Okay, you've got the idea of um, culture and common traditions, but you've also here got the idea of kinship, which is what we were stressing as well about being who is your who you are the son of um now bdag is obviously giving the new testament usage of how this word is so you don't normally want to study an old testament passage and say well this is what the word me meant in new testament times because there can be hundreds of years difference but what we see, if we go to Genesis 4, is that the idea of um, ethnos having common traditions and culture is not actually anachronistic, right? Because Genesis 4, 20 to 22 talks about Jabal. It says Jabal was the founder or the father of nomad herdsmen. It says Jubal was the founder of musicians. It says Tubal Cain was the founder of blacksmiths. So back in Genesis 4... When it's describing all these different people descended from Adam, what you see is that different families discovered different things. And as they discovered different things, like they dis discovered blacksmiths, uh, what is that really called? Blacksmithery or whatever. Uh, it's going to come to me later, isn't it? I'm going to be like, that was such an obvious word. Um, whatever the word is. Or someone else discovers music. You know, one day someone's blowing on something and it makes a, a noise and they're like, wow, music, you know, or however that worked. Um, so different families discover things and they create culture around those things, right? And these bits of culture, they're new and they're distinct from other families, and as they practice these things, they get known for them. So you would have ended up back in Genesis 4, even, you know, you end up with these different groups that are known for different bits of culture, different ethnicities. So at this stage, we can see that an ethnos is a body of people related to each other and sharing common culture and traditions. But here's the thing, right? Bodies of people right, goi or ethnos, are always changing. Um, and this happens through travel and marriage. Happened in the ancient world this way and still happens today. I'll give you an example from a friend of mine, right? A Ghanaian, an Iwe man, so he's Ghanaian, but he is from the Iwe tribe, right? He comes to London and he marries a Ghanaian woman who is a Shanti. She's from the Ashanti tribe in Ghana, right? And they are living on a council. Oh, sorry. He marries a woman who's living on a council estate in Roehampton. And she has a London accent, right? They have a son and he's viewed by some as Ghanaian, right? And some people view him as a Shanti because in the culture he would take his mother's tribe, okay? And But some would view him as black British. Others would view him as a Londoner because he's from Roehampton, from my estate. Some people would know him as a row boy, right? So do you see how, well, he grows up living in a body of people on an estate with multiple ethnic identities, right? Which body of people does he belong to? He belongs to multiple bodies of people at once. And then... He marries someone outside all these groups, 
okay, and has a child with her. And now this new family is changing the goy, is changing the ethnos, because now there is a a, a new um, ethnicity, if you like, which has different parts of different cultures together. So what this means is that ethnicity is fluid and it's not fixed. And I think you'll find that most anthropologists would say that say that as well, that it's a fluid thing. It's changing all the time. Okay, so back to um, our verse. It says that these people spread out. Yeah, these people, these goy, they spread out. And the Hebrew word is parad, which in holidays dictionary basically means divide, separate or branch off. All those words are good. That's the semantic range. I found the term branch off really helpful here for the context. Okay. It's a really helpful term in light of all of humanity is being descended from Adam and Noah, right? So what they do is they branch off from how the story's showing you that they've all got this common ancestor. So if you say separated, that, that's a valid translation, but it might sound like they've become disconnected from their source. They're disconnected from their federal head, Adam. And that's a bit of a problem uh, in light of British history, because for years we were indoctrinated with... Um, racial pseudoscience that said that there were like these four different categories of humans that had their own beginnings and so i don't like the word separate because of that i I don't have a big problem with it but i prefer branch off because it reminds us that everyone's coming from the same source the greek word in the septuagint translation is aphorizo which means to separate or to mark off by boundaries and um, just because to mark off by boundaries is in the semantic range doesn't mean you have to translate it like that. It just means that if in, if in that context that that is most likely what it's saying, then it, it can mean that. Um, but n- notice it's the same verb in both Hebrew and Greek that's used in Genesis 2.10. Okay, where it says, now a river flows from Eden to water the orchard, and from there it divides into four head streams. So it's like a river that's flowing into many streams, right? The, the different groups of people come from the same source, um, which is why I like the term branch off. Um, so ethnicity describes different streams of humanity all coming from the same river yeah so um when we think of ethnicity if we want to have a renewed mind about it then one of the things we need to think of when we think of ethnicity is the meaning of coming from the same source and if we're honest when we think of ethnicity that's not what we think but we need to renew our minds so we do start thinking that. Um, Because one of the problems with the term ethnicity is that it primarily conveys the ways that groups of humanity are different to one another. And that's okay, but because of our history, we need renewing of the mind where we also see different, but coming from the same ancestry and part of the same body of humanity. Okay, so... The human race, it's branched out from Adam and then from Noah, like streams of water flowing from their source. And here's the deep thing. God is planning to bring people back from each of the streams into Christ. Yeah, you see, you see that in various parts of scripture, but you also see it in Ephesians 1.10, where it says he's going to head when the times are fulfilled to head up all things in Christ. And it's interesting as well, because when it says to head up all things in Christ or to sum up all things in Christ, it's the Greek verb anakephalaioto, right? And um, what it means is people have debated this because you've got two words. You've got the first word ana, which like means again, and then you've got kephalaion, which means sum or sum total. But there's a slight possibility that when Paul's using this word, 
he's he's using it because it's got the same root as kephale, which is the Greek word for head, in which case Paul might be alluding to the fact that it's the idea of bringing everything together again under Christ's headship. And the whole idea of Christ's headship is a theme in Ephesians that you see in Ephesians 1.22, Ephesians 4.15, Ephesians 5.23. Okay, so there's a possibility that Paul had that in, in mind, but there's other people who say, no, it just means to, to sum everything up. Um, but even if it doesn't work in terms of what Paul actually had in mind when he chose that Greek word, it does actually work theologically. It is a theological truth that you've had all of humanity branch out from its source. And the idea is that people are being brought back together in Christ. Okay, so ethnicity should point us to Christ. It should remind us that the divided streams are going to come together one day in Christ. It should remind us of the coming together of all these streams that is even happening today and that we in the church are supposed to be working towards that. So I've given you a little diagram there um, in your workbook just to kind of show you what it looks like starting off with Adam and then and Noah and the descendants and they keep branching off as people have children and as people travel around you end up with all these different ethnicities and then the idea is that Christ comes and then what's happening is the idea is that the people are being brought back together into a new race Christ the in Christ race in contrast to the in Adam race all right, let's move on to territories now. So that, you know, it says in Genesis 10, 5, it says the maritime people spread out into their territories. The Hebrew word is Eretz. It means lands or territories. Be careful of reading too much into the word there, where it says their territories. Um, it's the same word that's used. Uh, it's the same, what would you say, grammar or syntax um, as where it says um, their clans. OK, um, so it doesn't mean they have a legal right to the land. Just make you aware of that, because I think some people have tried to make an argument from this about nations, modern nation states and their right to the land. And that I, I think that's a real stretch to read that from here. Um, the, the Greek word um, in the Septuagint is gay, meaning land. So we see that initially there was a land element to ethnicity where people live together. But this is fluid as well, right? Um, and we see in city life, don't we, that you end up with multiple ethnicities live together and not necessarily in distinct quarters of the city. You end up having different ethnicities all living together um, mixed with other ethnicities, but they are still distinct ethnicities. Later, we will find out that the land thing doesn't follow through to the new heavens and new earth where we might expect it to. So watch out for that. Next thing, language, right? Because it says that they, they spread out into their territories uh, by their clans within their nations, each with its own language. And when it says language, it's the Hebrew word lashon, which means tongue or language. So we see there's a language element to ethnos. OK, ethnicities tend to have their own language or their own dialect. And the Hebrew language would have been similar to the Canaanite languages. And if you want to read more about that, I've given you a ginormous footnote on that. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realize how similar the, the Hebrews were, the Israelites were to the uh, all the different Canaanite groups. OK, in the Septuagint, the Greek word that translates the Hebrew word Lashon is glossa, which means language. OK, moving on to clans, um, because it says that they are the people spread out into their territories by their clans. It's the Hebrew word Mishpaha, which means extended family or clan. And Hallot say, this is the Hallot definition, they say it's, it's a group in which the sense of blood relationship is still felt. Um, Holiday's Dictionary, which is like a cut down version of Hallot's Dictionary, says extended family clan, group in which there is a felt blood relationship. I can't remember why I've given you both of those definitions when they are so similar. 
Uh, the theological workbook of the Old Testament gives the definition of family or clan or kindred. And what's helpful here is that they make the point that it's, it's used in a wider sense than the English term family, okay? Uh, because uh, in Hebrew, your household, the people who lived in your household were, was, you would say house, you would say bet, okay, for house. Um, but mishpaha is a circle of relatives with strong blood ties. It's broader than a house. It would be a whole bunch of households. So they give the example of Joshua 7, right? When, you know, the sin of Achan, and they're trying to find out who's guilty. And first they call the tribe of Judah. And then they call the family, the Mishpaha of the Zerahites. And then they call a smaller unit, the household, the Bet of Zabdi. And from there they find one of his grandsons, one of Zabdi's grandsons, Akan, is the person who's guilty. So when you hear the word clan, um, think of much broader than just a a family that would live in a house and think broader than a four generational family living in a house together now the greek word for in the septuagint for mishpaha is phule is tribe okay now uh these words will be repeated later when we get to the new testament you don't have to memorize them now but you just need to have them floating around in your head so that Later, it triggers it and you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that word now. So fule is the word for tribe, right? So what we see at this stage is that ethnicities can contain tribes and clans within them that are larger than families, but smaller than ethnicities. Okay, let's go on to nations. Um, Genesis 10, 5, it says from these, the maritime people spread out into their territories by their clans within their nations. So at this stage, you'll probably be thinking, oh, there's a new category here, but it's not because it's the same Hebrew word goy. Yeah, it's been repeated again. Remember the Hebrew word goy for bodies of people? Yeah, or groups of people or a segment from the larger body of people. Right. So. Uh, and in Septuagint, it's the same Greek word, ethnos. Okay, so <laughs> not all translations pick up the repetition here. The Net Bible does, that, but in the Net Bible, it says, From these, the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone according to its language, according to their families, by their nations. So Net Bible um, shows the repetition. Uh, I think NASB does as well. But the problem is it uses the word nations again, which when we read it, we can't help but think of modern nation states. Well, maybe maybe you can, but I have difficulty not imposing my modern thinking on that. All right. So we've been looking at this verse five and we'll be seeing how these are the, the, the people from Japheth. We probably want to ask, who are the Japhetic people? Which is the name for the people who come from Japheth. And uh, I've got a quote for you here from um, Gordon Wenham, uh, Old Testament scholar. In his commentary on Genesis, he says, So far as these Japhetic peoples can be identified, they seem to represent the nations furthest removed from Israel geographically. Some of them are mentioned in Ezekiel 38.6 as coming, quote, from the uttermost parts of the north. So if this is correct, and we do have to be honest and acknowledge that for years, loads of people have tried to identify who all the different people groups are in Genesis 10 and come up with various stuff which doesn't all agree. And also um, people have tried coming up with stuff like saying that certain names indicate certain skin color, which I, I, I don't think is a convincing argument. Um, but what we are seeing here um, is the human race, the people in Adam are descended from Noah and they're, they're being spread out. They're being divided up into people with different languages. And um, whether Gordon Wenham is right or not, we know that some of these people will become enemies of the future body of people called Israel. 
Okay, so in this list here, there are people who will be the enemies of God's people, right? But we also know from our reading of the New Testament, from the book of Revelation, which we'll come to later, we know that one day representatives from all these groups will be brought together in Christ. Okay, so there is the branching out and the separating of people, but it's also being brought back together into the in Christ race. Okay, which is going to result in reconciliation, even when there are like the enemies of God's people, right? And one way to view it is like a tree. The tree, and there's a parable about this, right, in Matthew 13, but um, the tree of God's kingdom will over time grow and branch out so that the people groups can perch on those branches. If you aren't familiar with the Matthew 13 reference, it talks about the birds perching in the branches of the tree. In the Old Testament, there's references to the birds being the nations. I might be reading too much into it, but I see that as an allusion to people from all the different people groups resting on the branches of the tree. What's cool as well is that from John 15, we know that if we believe in Jesus, we are the branches of the vine, right? So we actually play this role in the church of being the branches for different ethnicities to come home to, to be united with Christ. So ethnicity should point us to the bringing together of people from all ethnicities in the church, so you see, I'm trying to encourage us to have renewing in mind about this. When we think ethnicity, we think about bringing people together in the church. So I've given you a diagram. I hope it helps. Um, diagrams can work different ways for different people, right? If it confuses you, just ignore it. But it starts off as in Adam, you got all these people branching out. That's the old age. But when Jesus comes, he brings in the new age. And now there's a new race called in Christ. And then there's this time period called the already but not yet, when we're waiting for Jesus to come back and bring about the new heavens, new earth. And, and during that time, God's people is growing and growing and growing and branching out with all the different ethnicities. So you start off with Jesus's disciples who are Jewish, and then you get Gentile believers, you know, you get Hellenistic Jews come in, you get Samaritans come in, you get Ethiopian eunuch come in, you get Persians come in, eventually you, uh, you, get, uh, you get more and more Africans coming in, and eventually you get Europeans coming in, and, and so on, and, and so on, you know, and it keeps growing until at the end, the new heavens and new earth, you've got representatives from every ethnicity all right, we're going to jump on to verse 6 now. Genesis 10, verse 6, it says, The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. Okay, so you, you know some of those countries already, uh, like Egypt. Um, but what is Cush? Well, Cush is modern-day Sudan, okay? Um, now, notice something here. It's talking about Cush, talking about modern-day Sudan, um, obviously the boundaries are totally different to how they are today in Sudan, but that's roughly the area. Notice that color is not mentioned here in Genesis. It's not that people were colorblind then. Uh, there's Egyptian artwork that depicts the Kushites as having black skin. So people knew what Kushites looked like. OK, um, but Moses, who's writing this account and whoever, you know, presumably people wrote accounts before Moses and Moses has managed to get hold of accounts and he's been able to write his own one. Um, Moses has not been racialized. Yeah, he's, he's not been trained to think in terms of there's four different races and the shapes of their heads are different and their hair types are different and, and the skin tones are different. He hasn't been racialized like that. The concept of whiteness hasn't been invented yet. He, does, he doesn't live in a world where white is seen as neutral or white is portrayed as superior he, and everything else is an aberration. Of, you know, you've got, everyone else is called people of color, you know, um, like that. He, he's not in a world like that. Um, he doesn't describe color as the main differentiator between people. Instead... He uses family history, language, 
and geography. And I think that's really significant. When the Bible tells us where we come from, where the Bible tells us how we are different, it doesn't use these racial categories. And then in verse 20, Genesis 10, verse 20, it says, these are the sons of Ham according to their families. And this again is the word mishpaha in Hebrew or phule in Greek, according to their languages, lashon in Hebrew, glossa in Greek, by their lands, Eretz in Hebrew, and now instead of gay, as we had before, it's now got the Greek word Korah for place or land or nation. And, and then it says, and by their nations, again, repetition here of that, that word we've had before in the past, which is goy, but in the plural, it's goyim. And again, our Greek word ethnos. Then Genesis 10, 31, these are the sons of Shem, according to their families, mishpaha, fule, according to their languages, lashon, glossa by their lands and according to their nations, Goyim, Ethnos. Okay. Um, Genesis 10, 32. Uh, These are the clans, Mishpaha, Fule, of Noah's sons, according to their lines of descent, within their nations, Goyim, Ethnos. From these, the nations, Goyim, Ethnos, spread out over the earth after the flood. By the way, I, I, I'm looking at my notes here and I'm thinking, I'm not too sure why I gave you the plural goyim and didn't give you the plural of ethnos. Um, not too sure why I've given you the Hebrew word in plural and the Greek word in singular. I have to look at that later to see why, why I did that. But I did tell you before, the plural of ethnos is um, ta ethne when they say the nations. Um, so at least you've got that somewhere in there. Okay, so we keep seeing these terms repeated, right? Um, Clans, tribes, nations, language. What do these verses point to in the New Testament? Revelation 5.9, in the Net Bible translation, it says, They were singing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were killed. This is talking about Christ. And at the cost of your own blood, You have purchased for God persons from every tribe, Greek word phule, language, Greek word glossa, people, Greek word laos or laos, the different words what we had before, and nation, ethnos. Okay, so you read this and straight away you're reminded of Genesis 10 the story of the spread of the people, right? Or what people call the table of nations. And, but you're also thinking, why does it say laos for people? Um, Why doesn't it say ethnos? Um, Well, laos and ethnos can sometimes have the same meaning. You can see that in BDAG. Um, Here, I think laos is, is referring to people groups that are not necessarily a nation, in terms of how they would understand a nation in the first century. And um, if you look at the footnote I've given you um, from David Orn, uh, his commentary on Revelation, he points out that these words were used by Josephus when he spoke of all the people, the Laos, being shown that Solomon was ruling over the Hebrew nation Ethnos and particularly the tribe, the Phule, of judah um so that would just be an example of some of one way that these words were differentiated by josephus um okay the main point here is that jesus has purchased people from these lost tribes peoples and nations and i'm saying lost in the sense that they're kind of lost from from their source and from their destination right uh because of the fall and so they're being brought back to jesus christ and then when you go on to revelation chapter 7 verse 9 it says in the net bible after these things i looked and here was an enormous crowd that no one could count and we come on to the relevance of that in future sessions made up of persons from every nation ethnos tribe 
phule, people, laos, and language, glossa, standing before the throne and before the lamb, dressed in long white robes and with palm branches in their hands. So these people, again, the the people that we hear about in Genesis 10, um, there's, there's representatives from each one of these groups, okay? And I'm not just saying from Genesis 10, I'm talking about the whole process that, that of spreading out and branching off that's been going throughout all human history creates all these different ethnicities, right? And at the end, there's representatives from each one in long white robes. Well, wh- what does that mean? I think it means they've been justified. They are justified with Jesus's robe of righteousness, which means that God plans to justify persons from every ethnicity with Christ's righteousness, not with their own. Sometimes with ethnicity, we get a a certain self-righteousness. We get brought up with a self-righteousness about our ethnicity. If you're white, that, that can be particularly noticeable to people of other ethnicities from subdominant cultures, um, seeing the sort of self-righteousness um, that people can have, being trained to think that white is is better. Although we did say earlier that white is really a racial category more than a, an ethnic category. Um, notice as well here, there's no mention of lands. Okay, when John's right in this, he doesn't say anything about their their lands. And it's interesting as well, because in Matthew 5, 5, Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth. Okay, so it, it seems as if there's a sense in which in the new heavens and new earth, the way land works and where people are in the land is a bit different to how it was in the old order of things. It says to me that the land that your ethnicity owns if you could even use that word own, uh, maybe it's a better word would be steward that you steward or I, I, I'm not too sure, but, um, there is a Bible scholar called Willie Jennings who's written about this. Um, maybe this is pointing us to the fact that the land is an ultimate, um, you know, notice also that their ethnic distinctiveness can be seen clearly. John can spot these guys. He knows they're from every tribe. And that is that is really important that we see that it's okay to have distinctiveness between different ethnicities. Okay. Notice that Genesis 10 is not a racial table. Okay. Uh, there's been no emphasis on skin color, no emphasis on facial features, and no emphasis on like, racial superiority or even ethnic superiority in Genesis 10. But these are the things in British history we saw was a big part of how people viewed other groups. They would emphasize these things and they would conclude that some people and some skin tones demonstrated people being superior. But these things are modern obsessions that come from being racialized. They're they're not the way that Moses would have thought. Don't get me wrong. People were still prejudiced in the ancient world, but not along physical features. There were Greek writers who would talk about different physical features that people had, but they would more link it to the climate of people. And then they would say how the weather and the temperature would affect certain people's temperaments and that Um, very different to the whole race stuff that we look through. So... Moses is not writing to discuss physical features, but what he is doing is he's writing to the Israelites, pointing out their common ancestry with everyone else. And that leads us on to the next thing, which is really deep. Notice that Genesis 10 is not ethnocentric. Okay, it's not written from the Israelites' point of view. It's not written from Moses' point of view. It's not written from a point of view that says, hey, Israel's at the center. We're at the center. And let's look at how everyone else relates to us. No, Israel isn't even mentioned in Genesis 10 as one of the ancient peoples of the world. Okay. Instead, the viewpoint is of God spreading the people out from Noah's ancestry, which followed on from Adam. And the viewpoint is that these groups are all human. In fact, they are all the new humanity 
of the new creation from the flood. So there's an idea of hope here that God has a plan for Adam's mandate to subdue the earth, to spread God's loving rule. When Adam and Eve sinned, that looked like it got messed up. Then you had the flood. Then they looked like, well, that's really messed up. But then God has all these people that are being spread out. And it shows that God has a plan. He has a plan for his image bearers to spread his loving rule all over the earth, which means the whole purpose of people groups is to fulfill God's plan. The whole purpose of ethnicity is to fulfill God's plan. All right, we're going to sum all this stuff up now, okay? Um, Firstly, Encyclopedia Britannica, I'll try saying that again, Encyclopedia Britannica sees ethnicities as culturally, not biologically, distinct groups through language, music, values, art, styles, literature, family life, religion, ritual, food, naming, public life, and material culture. This view is compatible with Genesis 10, right? Although it doesn't go far enough in terms of how we should biblically view ethnicity. So we've had hundreds of years of distorting the image of God that has come into our education systems, come into our advertising, it's come into our entertainment, comes into our movies, comes into our books, comes into our relationships, comes into our family life, comes into our government, comes into our laws, comes into how the military function, comes into foreign policy. I won't go on anymore, don't worry. But all of this stuff has been going on for hundreds of years and has been evolving. You know, we, we've already studied this, right? It means that what we need now is renewing of the mind about this. And us Christians need to be at the forefront of doing this because the Bible tells us to renew our minds, right? And so we need to be um, accepting the common grace that anthropologists have shown us about ethnicity and how they've said this is a better way of viewing people than race. Okay, we can accept that and at the same time say, Do you know what? When I look at the Bible, when I look at Genesis 10, I see other layers that I need to add to my understanding of ethnicity. And so let me sum them up here, right? Ethnicities are smaller parts of the larger body of humanity. As much as we see ourselves as different parts, we got to see ourselves as part of the one whole, right? We're all cousins. So if this helps, remember it this way. When we hear ethnicity, we need to think ethnicity from one, right? And what I mean by that is ethnicity from Adam, to understand that all, all the different ethnicities come from Adam, okay? If that, if that phrase ethnicity from one helps you, then use it. Next thing, ethnicities are streams from the larger river of humanity, that are making their way back to God. Okay. So, or, or you could say they're streams from the larger body of water of humanity that are making their way back to God. So in the already, but not yet, we, the church are to assist in this process. The church is continually growing its branches and its streams so that more ethnicities can join. Okay, so when we hear ethnicity, think ethnicity from one to one. Okay, if that helps you remember that ethnicity from one to one. Okay, this is how I'm trying to train my brain that when I think of ethnicity, I think ethnicity from one, that's Adam, to one, that's Christ. And in that little phrase there, I've basically got a more biblical understanding of ethnicity than I used to have. Okay, next thing. Ethnicity includes who your father and ancestors are. So knowing your family tree is a legitimate identity marker. 
Okay. Now, if you don't know your family tree, that's so that's okay, right? But but if you if you do know it, it's okay to identify with that and say, "I'm the son of who's the son of who's the son of my ancestors." Go back to whatever you know. It's cool to 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 do that. Okay. It's cool to be. It's totally fine to be like I'm Yoruba. That is significant, right? What this ultimately does when we think of our ancestry is it ultimately points us to adam as our ancestor we could you you could be like i am from this tribe going back to adam yeah um and what it also does for those of us who believe in jesus it points us to our heavenly father we say, I'm the son of so-and-so, who's the son of so-and-so, who's a, and my heavenly father, I'm the son of God, right? And that's an even more important identity marker, which is why I said, if you don't know your family tree, you don't know where you come from, if you're in Christ, then you can take great comfort in the fact that you do know you come from Adam, so you, you, <laughs> you've got that one locked, but also, so you're, you're a son of Adam, but also you're a son of God, right? You're a son of God. And I don't know if earlier I misspoke. Did I maybe say I'm the son of God when I meant to say I'm a son of God? Did I do that? Because that was kind of bad if I did. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So, but whilst I'm saying that being the son of God is the more important identity marker, it doesn't erase our ethnic identity. Okay. So, you're, you, so I'm not saying, oh, ignore your ethnic identity. It doesn't get erased. Okay, next thing. Ethnicity involves language and culture, which is a more helpful way of thinking about people than racial phenotypes based on skull size and hair type and skin color, right? Now, obviously, when you've got groups of people living together and living separate from other groups of people, you will be able to see certain physical characteristics, okay? But in cities, we see more of a mixture, right? As, as people come together and racial categories will eventually fail us. So for example, um, the children of two mixed race parents, what do, what do you call them if you're using racial categories? You know, we don't have a, a term for that unless there's a new term that I haven't, haven't learned yet. But as far as I know, there is no term for that. And so our racial categories are already failing us. The people having children, where both parents are mixed race, their child, what's the term for it? Well, we're probably better off using ethnicity terms rather than trying to use the racial terms, which don't, they're often inconsistent and illogical. Okay. Also, there's nothing wrong with this distinctiveness being on display. The different cultures, the different clothing, the different hairstyles and whatnot. Okay, assimilation to the majority culture is not a biblical goal. Uh, you know, when John has his vision, he gets to see people from all these different tribes. So there was a distinctiveness that was on show for the glory of God. It's actually part of the salvation history. Okay, it's part of the story that God is saving people from these different distinct groups. So there's nothing wrong with showing that distinctiveness. Next point. Ethnicity is fluid, um, as many secular voices would agree. It changes all the time. Last point, the whole purpose of ethnicities is to fulfill God's plan, part of which is to justify people from every ethnicity. We will see more of this later when we do Abraham. But for now, we just say ethnic identity shouldn't be a source of self-righteousness. We need to examine ourselves if that is the case. Also, because it's God's plan, the people groups, the ethnicities, it's God's plan, right? So we should have a God-centric view of ethnicity rather than an ethnocentric view of ethnicity. We will naturally have an ethnocentric view of ethnicity. We need the renewing of the mind to have a God-centric view of it. All right. Any questions? 
people do debate it because some people have actually said, hey, kind of what's happened is that people, people have swapped race for ethnicity and have carried on being racist, but they're just using different words now. They might not say, oh, black people are like this, but they might say black culture. People might say, oh, black culture is always like this or black culture is always like that. And they're, what they're doing is, is still some of the same racist beliefs, but instead of linking it to biology, it's now being linked to culture. So some people have said, hey, even when we use, talk about ethnicity instead of race, we still have the same problems. And that's one of the reasons why I'm saying, well, what we need to do is, is have more renewing of the mind. So we're not just saying, well, let's switch our terminology from race to ethnicity, but let's actually think, how does God want us to view people of different ethnicities? And also, I should just clarify, like on that note, I still, I still think there's a place for using the terminology of race um, in, in as far as it's helpful to talk about how we've been racialized and it's helpful to talk about racial crime so if we tomorrow said hey the whole of britain is no longer allowed to use the word race we'd still have racism but we wouldn't have any language to describe it you, you know um so i think it is still helpful to talk about how we've been racialized and all that kind of stuff i'm not advocating only ever use the word ethnicity Yeah, that's a great point. So I, th I think that when you look at these definitions of ethnicity and when you look at the geography of Britain, you see that we have, we have geographical areas, we have council estates where you have a body of people who live together. They have the same customs, the same values, the same dialect, right? And which is distinct to other areas and you will find a lot of people related by family you know even though like my estate is in london which obviously has people moving in and out of all the time in london but there's still a handful of really big families on our estate <laughs> you know so there's still a certain amount of kinship you know um and so there there could be a sense in which some some council estates end up operating like ethnicities and who knows it uh you know when the bible talks about these tribes because remember as well we saw that you get um your ethnicities can contain smaller smaller groups within them an ethnos can have a clan within it which is bigger than a household so who knows if in god's mind that uh, Revelation is actually talking about people from, including people from certain council estates, I in which case you've got class becoming a part of ethnicity because on council estates you predominantly have one class of people, like the lower classes, not always the case. but So there, there is scope for, for that, but I also um, say that tentatively. Um, because I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs>